Okay, I'm, I'm kind of scared uh, to be up here. Um, okay, so my name is Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, I go by AFER online. I work for a company called Factual, which produces uh, big data sets about locations and points of interest, hotels, doctors, that sort of thing. Uh, this particular talk, though, is actually going to be about the intersection of computer science theory, uh, you know, sort of this beautiful mathematics and these, these nice proofs about systems properties, and, and what happens when you try to put those into practice in a real system. Uh, a lot of times when you combine theory and hardware, you get something which may not resemble either of them, uh, the sort of messy, bubbly software. Um, and that software tends to fail in interesting ways at the boundaries of systems. If you look at the problem of reliability, a lot of times you'll have connected components which have to interact at these kind of seams, uh, places where one system talks to another, maybe the language changes, maybe it talks over a network. And at that boundary, you'll see a point of uh, sort of time-bounded consistency requirements. So I'm going to make an HTTP call to uh, a server, and I'm going to ask it for some data. And it's got to respond within you know, five seconds, 500 milliseconds, whatever, and tell me, OK, your write succeeded, or your write failed. And if I don't get a response in a, a, a short amount of time, then I know something terribly wrong has happened. This, this terribly wrong stuff uh, is, is hard to consider under normal circumstances, but gets really crazy in the case of partitions. Uh, and a lot of people don't believe partitions can happen. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the open questions in our industry is actually how big are these problems in practice? Microsoft put out a paper a little while ago saying that their WAN links that, you know, between data centers would go down roughly two and a half, three and a half days per year. Their internal networks tended to have uh, about 10 times more reliability, so talking about maybe uh, you know, two thirds of a day per year. Um, that, that's not good enough, I think, for highly available applications. When, when you have a network partition in practice, well, okay, first, what is a partition? It's, it's where the network can arbitrarily drop, reorder, <coughs> delay, or duplicate packets. Uh, in practice, TCP takes care of a lot of that, that reordering problem. And so you'll just make a read on a socket, and nothing's going to come back. You know, there's nothing where your node needs to lie. Uh, my perfect sky is torn. So <laughs> when this happens, your system will change. It'll alter state. It'll enter some new mode of existence. And when you bring the system back together, uh, You'll, you'll have to, to converge to, to understand what happened on both sides, um, and, and maybe you'll blame the other. So I want to show what happens in a particular uh, application. Uh, this this system is going to be really simple. It's going to be a, a sort of proxy example that I can talk about in, a, in one talk uh, that demonstrates some of the problems with more complex applications. So we're going to take a bunch of clients, uh, five clients, and client number zero is going to add the number zero, 5, 10, 15. Client number one is going to add 1, 6, and so on. Uh, they're going to do this concurrently, possibly on both sides of a network partition. And at the end of the test, we're going to ask for all those numbers back. Now, if the application fails, if the database says, no, you can't have that right, I'm sorry, uh, then we don't expect to see the, the, the number in the final result. If the database lies to us and says, yeah, sure, I took your right, and it's gone, we know we've got a problem. So I'm going to run this application on five nodes, uh, n1 through n5. Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to cut the strings, and hopefully they'll go out of sync. The general form for this talk is going to be uh, the, the client will make a request, the network will lag in some way, we'll lose, we'll lose some data, and we'll be unsure about the state of the system. There'll be some inconsistency introduced. First off, Postgres. Uh, we all like Postgres, right? It's, it's, a, it's a nice, classic, very heavily uh, tested model uh, of, a, of a sort of hard CP system. If you run it with a single primary and you don't promote your secondaries, um, it will give you, 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 it behaves very much like a single node system. It's not what we think of as distributed because it's only one master. All your transactions are consistent on that node. If you lose access to that node, you're, you're uh, no longer available. However, the system is actually distributed because the clients are on the opposite side of a network. And, and this leads to this problem, right? Because Postgres uses two-phase commit, which is actually not, uh, not correct or not, not consistent in the face of a partition. It is not partition tolerant. And when, when the client and the server are voting to commit, you know, if the client says, OK, I'm ready to commit the transaction, server says, all right, I accept that. It checks out with consistency uh, guarantees I need to provide. I'll write the data, and I'll return an acknowledgment. Well, if the acknowledgment is dropped because the network you know, goes away, the client has no idea for the rest of all time what happened. Uh, you know, this, is, this is sort of a consequence of FLP. or, or it's, it's a too general problem. right? We can't ever agree on what's going to happen uh, unless we, we go to some stronger form of consistency, maybe uh, extended three-phase commit. Um, and so your clients can see an error and not be sure about whether that write is ever coming back from jail. Uh, 
Yeah, QPC. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, the server is going to is going to be uh, interacting with five clients. Um, it's all going to run on N1. You cut off all of the network connections at once. And if you're lucky, you'll see something like this. You'll see uh, insert into set app. Uh, you know, here's the the elements table, uh, or sorry, the elements field. We're going to set the value 253. So this is one of the numbers we're writing. Um, but it says failure to execute query with SQL. An I/O error occurred while sending to the back end. So your code throws an exception, right? And like you do a bunch of you, you enter rollbacks and you lock some stuff to disk and you're like, oh shoot, it failed. I'm going to throw a 503 back to the client. Um, you know, sorry, I couldn't take your write. Well, if you then go and look after the fact, you'll see that two of these writes, uh, which were not acknowledged by the server, actually survived. So, so number 181 and 184 in, the, in, this, in this particular test uh, are present in the final result, even though the client said they failed. And, and the real answer here is that it's not really a failure. A network partition or network failure, any sort of I.O. Uh, exception, means you don't know what happened. It doesn't mean it failed. It just means that it might have succeeded and it might not have. In practice, this is, this is not the worst thing that can happen, because uh, false negatives are not as bad as false positives. Right? If, you, if you drop data, that's really bad. If you have extra data, that's usually better. And, and a lot of times, your operations are idempotent, right? Because Postgres has really strong consistency. So you can just retry cleanly, and maybe you know, the, the consistency checks will prevent you from double inserting an entry. Uh, if it's a counter, you maybe get an extra count on your video watches. It's not a huge deal. It's only going to happen uh, once for the in-flight uh, you know, uh, commits that are happening during the network partition starting. Anything subsequent to that will fail cleanly. If you want to be really strong, you can, you can fetch a transaction ID, write it to a table, and check for its presence later. Redis. Moving from CP uh, towards something else. Uh, Redis, Redis is a data structure server, right? So it gives you this nice, uh, a fully serialized uh, set of operations on one node because it does everything in serial, right? There's no, there's no parallelism in Redis itself. Uh, this has all sorts of nice app, uh, you know, sort of operational characteristics for developers. They say, oh, I write a value, I read a value, I will never read stale writes, I'll never read phantom writes. Um, so in, in practice, you, you do all your operations because it's primary, and then for high availability, you replicate your, your data asynchronously to end secondaries. Right? So here all the clients talk to node one, and then it's, it's, it's pushed out to nodes two through five. And you say, okay, well, that's nice. What happens when the master fails? Uh, well, we can promote one of the secondaries, right? Because it's got a copy of that data. Uh, and Antiros tells us that Redis cluster is in system bias towards consistency rather than availability. Uh, it's an HA solution based on Redis Sentinel, uh, which has the dogma of consistency and master slave setups. So Redis Sentinel is this sort of sidelong program that watches all the masters. And it'll tell us, oh, uh, this primary is inaccessible. I'm voting to exclude it from the cluster. We're going to try and reach consensus on a new primary to elect. And then all the clients, yeah, you need to go talk to this primary now, because it's the real authoritative uh, owner of your data. The clients should all uh, talk to this new, this new primary, which will be in the majority component of this partition. Note that this is a partition which a CP system can handle. We've only partitioned it into two pieces, one of which has a majority. And the majority uh, guarantees us that we can make progress. Uh, quick note on durability. Uh, this, this system, Redis, uh, it, it only guarantees us that the log is intact up to a given point. So if you make a write, it might not make it to disk. But given the existence of write n, writes n minus 1, n minus 2, all those guys should, should be present. right? So there should be no holes in, in the transaction log or in, in, the, in the state of the database. Um, and we expect that that same loss could happen because the replication is asynchronous. So we could see some missing most recent data when we do the failover. Uh, now, I want to I wanna actually do this. Um, I don't think many people will try this sort of thing. So I'm going to uh, run an instance of Redis. So here are five Redis servers, uh, which are already running. Kill them, start a new one. Cool, so that's Redis. I'm going to start up uh, Redis Sentinel. Redis Sentinel is going to connect to uh, these five servers and try to vote uh, to make sure that they all have a consistent idea about who is the primary. And if we ask about Redis's replication, Redis is going to tell us, OK, these four are slaves, and N1 is the master. Four connected slaves. Good to go. So let's actually run our, our application. Uh, Redis. Cool. So I'm going to cause a network partition immediately after this begins. So when you start, cool. We're making writes. Now let's go over here 
and say jepson.partition. So I'm going to cut those nodes off. N1 and N2 are now isolated from the remainder. Notice that writes are proceeding against N1, the primary, even though we, haven't, uh, we can't replicate those writes to a majority of the cluster. Um, now, the, the nodes that are doing uh, Sentinel will have noticed the failure. They say S down, subjective down, master, uh, objective down, master. So we've all agreed. And now we've agreed to fail over to a new master and to notify all of the clients. So the clients are now proceeding against this, this new master, uh, which is probably N5, I'm guessing. Um, so we're going to complete a bunch of these writes. I'm going to heal the partition, uh, which reconnects the cluster. And now, if we ask about Redis's replication state, we'll see that we've got a master on N3, right? This is the failover master, this, the one that was elected the new majority component. And N1, also a master. N1 claims to have four connected slaves. N3 claims to have two connected slaves. Now, how is that possible? Um, well, the answer is that th this, is, this is Redis uh, master as of a couple weeks ago, which is the, the most recent version of, of Sentinel you can get. There's actually a change now which will demote the master. But this is in split brain, and it will remain in split brain permanently. Uh, if we collect the data, you'll see that out of uh, 2,000 writes, we acknowledged 1,260, sorry, we acknowledged 2,000 of them. So all these writes supposedly completed and were written to the database, but only 736 of those numbers are still in the database now. It threw away 60% of our data. Um, this, this is not what we expected. Uh, not only have we violated the assumption that there's a single master, because there were two masters, right? This is a split brain system. Um, but even after that point, we're allowed to have holes in the transaction log, because we're only going to preserve all the commits that happen on one and not the other. So depending on whichever one you talk to, you'll get a different view of the system. Uh, in this particular case, we had a 16% light write loss. It can really vary based on how heavily uh, your concurrent application is hitting, how frequently you repull, what your Redis clients do. There's a lot of opportunity for inconsistency and delay in propagation. Um, the new version of Redis, uh, which was pushed, I think, on Wednesday, uh, will actually correctly demote the secondary, which shortens the window of data loss, but uh, actually makes it worse, because now instead of having two copies of the data, you know, half the data on one node, half the data on the other, now you just throw away half of it. Uh, so that's the thing. Um, the, the problem here is that the, the primaries are evolving independently, and we've allowed them to diverge, and there's no way to reconcile the data on both sides. Uh, what can you do if you're a Redis user? You can accept data loss, right? Not all the applications have to be consistent. In particular, you should know this, that uh, Redis in a high availability uh, you know, failover setup with replication uh, is not a consistent database. It is not a queue. It is not a lock server. If you use it as a queue, you could enqueue an, an item once and check it out twice, or check it out never. Uh, you can take a lockout on as many nodes as there are masters simultaneously. Um, you could take a lockout and then never be able to remove it. Uh, so there's all sorts of awful possibilities here coming about, again, as a result of split brain. Uh, if you use Redis, it's important that you monitor for these failures. Because those writes succeeded, the client libraries will hide the failure from you, which means they will hide write loss. Uh, practically speaking, you can use Redis replication to keep your caches hot, but not necessarily as a data store. Moving again uh, from I don't know what sort of consistency to CP, uh, I think. Let's talk about Mongo. Mongo is a document store. Uh, similar distribution design to Redis, right? Asynchronous replication, single writable primary. Uh, but it's got a twist. You can await the acknowledgments and the errors from the secondary nodes. So that means that when I make a write, I can say, oh, don't return success until I've seen three nodes or four nodes or however many actually commit it. I want to make sure that my write is not only on durable storage on the primary, but has also been replicated. Uh, the other nice thing about Redis, operationally speaking, is that its, it's election topology is, is built in. So Redis has a secondary program you run to, uh, to monitor it and to make sure that the election takes place. If you're not careful about the election topology, the Sentinel topology, really interesting things can happen. Um, Mongo at least puts it all into the same server, so you, the servers know what their own network visibility is. Uh, so we're going to make all of our writes to the primary, N1. We're going we're to introduce a partition, and the nodes on uh, the majority component will be like, hey, I lost N1. Where's my primary? How do I go on with life? Uh, the answer is that the primaries will start, or sorry, the uh, majority components will start to vote. They'll compete to have the highest op time which is a, a timestamp plus uh, you know, an incrementing counter for the number of writes that happen in that timestamp. Whoever has the highest op time, you know, has seen the most writes from the old primary. Uh, if there's multiple primaries, I wonder what happens. Uh, whoever's seen the most writes, that will become the new primary and will continue on with life in the majority component. So 
Uh, the old defaults in Mongo were unacknowledged, which is where you make a write and you, you don't ask what happened to it, you just assume it succeeded. Um, that, of course, is gonna lose data. Uh, we, can, we can predict when you make this, uh, this partition, we're gonna see the nodes N3 through N4 in secondary mode. I apologize for the text. Uh, writes will complete okay because they're not being replicated. And in fact, we're not even asking whether they were written to any bit, uh, anybody's disk or any, any uh, replicated nodes. Um, when we reconnect the system, uh, we'll see a, a problem, right? The, the data that was written to the old primary is isolated from the new primary. They're, they're causally disjoint. And so it doesn't even, it doesn't even have to be wall clock time, right? Like you could shut down the old primary and bring up a new primary. Uh, at different times, there could be a, a point in, in wall clock time where there's no primary node. And you can still lose data because the two are not causally connected. Or the only thing that matters in distributed systems is the causal relationships, not necessarily the temporal relationships. So that secondary is going to hold on to those rights. And then when the partition resolves, it has to figure out, oh my gosh, we've got different views of the world. What, what happened? Um, Mongo's strategy is to do this thing called rollback, where it, uh, it takes the data uh, that was, that was uh, in conflict with the primary. They'll figure out what point they diverged, like when do we last have a common op time. And then I'm going to put all of those rights from the rollback into a file on disk. So this is, this is the node saying, OK, uh, entering REPL set rollback mode. I'm going to find a common point with the current primary, um, reset to my old point, throw my writes onto disk, and then catch up with the, with the current primary. Uh, those, those rollback files are important because that's the only copy of your data uh, that happened on that, on that primary before it, it went down. Um, if you don't check for those rollback files, you don't have your data. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've had a really hard time getting Mongo to reliably generate rollback files even when it does lose data. So I, I don't know what that's about. Um, if you look at the source, there's some stuff about the uh, collections codes. If you use capped collections, it actually just doesn't try to recover. It just throws those rights away. Uh, all sorts of behavior. The, the end result is if you use unacknowledged, you can expect to lose lots of rights. In this case, 23%. So we say, OK, uh, unsafe was clearly not the right default. Let's go to safe. Um, so safe loses 34% rights. <laughs> Why? <laughs> like, what, what, what is going on? It's, it's that, again, there's, there's two primaries, maybe not the same physical wall clock time, although there could be if you have clock skew. Uh, and it, it's that they're not causally connected. So we say, OK, ah, there's this other setting, replica safe. Let's try that one. I'm sure that'll work. Uh, so redis.stop. OK, redis is down. Uh, Mongo.tail. So these are the Mongo logs. And let's take a look at what Mongo thinks the current state is. So right now, all the nodes agree that uh, N1 is the primary, and everybody's fully connected. So let's go ahead and prepare to partition. And I'm going to run Mongo uh, replica safe. And we'll do like 6,000 writes for this one. So when that starts, writes are beginning. We introduce a partition. Now let's see what, uh, what Mongo thinks the state is. Uh, OK, so everybody's still fully connected. Not true. It takes a while to figure out that the failures occurred, right? So now we see the nodes are starting to, to notice the failures. Uh, if we ask about Mongo's replication status, now we see these not reachable messages. Again, inconsistent state between the nodes because it takes a different amount of time for each one to identify that their connection has failed. So wall clock time, a really hard thing in distributed systems. Now at some point, we should all agree, great, so mostly in concordance on this now that uh, that node is actually gone. N4 is refusing to elect itself because it has a lower op time than another node in the majority component. So the one that has the highest, ah, REPL set member N5 is now in state primary. That's because it had the highest op time. So this guarantees us that we're not going to uh, elect a primary that has some really outdated state. We're going to try and pick the freshest one. Uh, so now we've got one primary, uh, N5, and I'm going to heal the partition. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this on uh, small windows. Cool. So uh, it's healed. We now see one primary and a bunch of secondaries. Notice again that our writes uh, will fail briefly during the handoff, right? Because there's, there's no primaries available. Um, right now, Mongo is telling us that I can't fulfill your writes until a new primary is elected. So we've now failed back over to N1, the original primary. 
The question is, how many of our writes are present with replicas safe? The answer is, out of uh, 6,000 writes, 58, 25 of them succeeded, according to Mongo. Uh, but 15, 12 of those acknowledged writes were thrown away. OK. Uh, replica safe. Um, <laughs> not safe. It will roll that op log back. Uh, we should expect to see some files on disk. Let's, let's actually ask about that. Um, rollbacks. So I'm going to take a look at this directory on disk. Notice there are no rollback files. This is where our data was supposed to be. Um, there should be a directory listing here, like showing these BSON files that have all the data in them. It wasn't written. I don't know why. Uh, I've been able to replicate it sometimes, not others. So questions? Majority. Ah, now we figured it out. We only wrote to replica safe, which only writes to two replicas. But we've got five nodes. So uh, if we want to guarantee that a given write is present in any future majority, you know, a, a majority is a component that could, that could elect a new primary and begin taking writes. We want to make sure that our writes appear in that majority. We have to write to a majority ourselves. So write concern majority does that. It says, OK, you've got to replicate to three out of the five, or seven out of the 12, or, or something like that. Um, if you, if you do this, you'll find that it actually drops rights. Uh, less, less. This is only two rights lost, but they're still acknowledged and then thrown away. Um, why? The, 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 reason, the reason for this is uh, actually a bug, I think, in MongoDB. Uh, it's, it's that it considers a, during, when, it, when the system partitions and those network connections drop, the primary just sort of signs off on the right concerns and says, oh, yeah, sure, you're done, you're good to go. Uh, instead of telling them that the, that the replication failed. Uh, so that, I think, is now fixed in master as of like Tuesday or something. Um, so if you're running Mongo earlier than that, you can lose data even at the strongest replication concerns. The fundamental problem here is that there's no consistency protocol on writes. We can't tell the system that we expect our, our writes to be uh, replicated and that those, those replication operations are atomic. Atomic operations uh, you know, either succeed or fail as a unit. In this case, they can succeed on some nodes, but fail on others. We need to guarantee those transactions uh, either succeed or fail on all nodes. So if you use MongoDB, you can accept more data loss, uh, right? Because Facebook does it, right? If you ever look at your wall posts, like there's stuff appearing and disappearing all the time. I look at the Twitter DM light, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like consistency is not necessarily the most important thing in the world. Uh, if you do want it, you can look through the rollback files, assuming they are written successfully. Uh, you can also write with write concern majority, which drastically cuts down on the, the fraction of writes you can lose in a partition, um, in this case from lots to only a couple. Uh, notice that this is going to really slow down your system, because now you have to wait for all these nodes to come back. So the speed advantages that you might have led you to choose MongoDB in the first place might no longer be so compelling. Let's talk about Ryuk. Uh, moving, moving again from hard CP to hard AP, and I say hard with a reason. Uh, Rioc is a very different sort of beast than these earlier databases. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, not earlier, um, they're contemporary, but Rioc is a different beast than the earlier things in the talk because it is a ring. It has all these nodes acting as, as equal participants. So we're going we're gonna to take a given key and put it onto three nodes in the ring, uh, and then those nodes are going to cooperate in some way to accept rights and reconcile differences. Uh, in this case, all of our clients are talking to the local node. So N1 talks to client 1, N5 talks to client 5, and so forth. We're going to cut the, the system in half. And like one of those worms that you, you cut it in half and it regrows both sides, Mongo, sorry, Rioc is going to uh, set up failover nodes, failover uh, V nodes that will take over the portions of the ring which are inaccessible. So it can continue to replicate your data on both sides and give you durability guarantees. Uh, this is what the Dynamo system is designed to do, to, to handle uh, partitions. Now, Rioc tells us that it has tunable cap controls. That sounds fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So we've stopped calling it that now. Uh, this, you know, what people say is like, okay, re, uh, the read value, the number of nodes you read from, plus the write value, the number of writes, nodes you write to, if that's greater than the number of replicas in the system, then we, we should be guaranteed an overlap. So that should, that should be, uh, you know, reads your writes. Um, well, let's, let's give that a shot. Let's try last write wins, um, which actually in this case is allow mode false, but I think the same thing happens both ways. Uh, I'll go to stop. So this is a, uh, a React cluster, again, running on five nodes. And I'm going to run a simple React app. Uh, last write wins. This is with um, R and W equal to quorum. So 
so we should expect to see, since we're, since we're reading and writing with majority, that uh, everybody always reads their rights, and we should have uh, you know, consistency. Um, this drops 71% of our data. Why is it dropping all this data? Like, why, why out of our rights are only, out of 100 rights, why are only 29 actually present? Um, the reason is, uh, this is a data race. We've got multiple uh, nodes trying to operate on the same data at the same time. So the, uh, the problem is that React with last right wins or allow more false is going to take the most recently time-stamped entry during these you know, concurrent operations and discard the older one. Um, so a lot of those writes were concurrent, and so we discarded a bunch of the writes, uh, which just happened to fall in with lower timestamps. Um, React won't tell you when this happens, right? Because it's, that's what last right wins is supposed to do. So you say, OK, I know how to solve data races. Uh, we, just, we just add a lock. Uh, we'll choose a CAP uh, lock, which operates over partitions and gives us perfect, um, you know, perfect exclusion. Uh, and if we, if we add this lock to the system and prevent ourselves from ever writing at the same time, then, then we should be able to recover appropriate behavior. And in fact, we do. Uh, out of 100 writes, 100 are acknowledged and 100 are present. So the lock has solved our problem. Great, you say, OK, I use React and I add a lock. Um, I, I know there are CP locks. I can use Zookeeper. So uh, problem solved. Uh, well, not in the case of a partition. Because if you do have a partition, well, the first thing you'll notice is that React is going to get really slow. Uh, your, your get and put FSM times will probably jump up to 60 seconds, which effectively is unavailable for a lot of, a lot of applications. Um, this is because in the event that a node dies, uh, writes will just sort of pile up waiting to talk to this node until we can actually declare it down. So React gets really slow during this time, during the, during the transition between uh, you know, topologies. But when it resolves, it'll continue to accept writes OK. And we find out that we threw away maybe 12% of our writes. So what gives? Right? We, had a, we, had a perfect, we had a perfect lock. We're writing and reading with Quorum. What, what went wrong? Well, the answer is that the, uh, the fallback V nodes were set up on both sides. There's a complete ring in two different sides of the partition. We were able to successfully read and write on both sides independently. And then when the sides came back into contact, we had to throw away whichever one had the, the lower timestamp. Um, so, so what we need to just do is make sure that only one side of the partition can make progress. We want to become a CP system. So you say, ah, primary read, primary write, that'll do it. Uh, primary read and primary write mean that we, we don't allow the fallback V nodes to count. We, we need to see a majority of the primary V nodes, the original owners who are stable over time, respond to our query. And in that case, we should see one side of the partition make progress and one side not make progress. So let's go ahead and try that. Uh, instead of sloppy quorum, I'm going to run a full quorum. And I can leave the lock in or, or leave it out. Uh, it has actually the same effect in this case. So I'm going to start that and partition the system. OK, writes begin. We start a partition. Uh, notice that our writes have paused. We're now stuck waiting on React to uh, you know, reconfigure, to detect the failures. Um, so during this time, writes will become very slow. They won't actually fail, but it'll take you know, 30, 60 seconds or whatever to, to figure out what's happening. Um, so practically speaking, you know, this, this particular client code, we'll, we'll consider that timeout and reporting as a failure. Uh, and at some point, React should detect that the system has, has uh, you know, gone into a partition state it's started to remove these connections. So this N1 is figured out, N5 is not responding, N4 is not responding, uh, and it should be spinning up fallback V nodes. After a few minutes, we expect to see uh, a, a new state of the ring in which on the majority component, we've got some set of primary V nodes available, and then the minority component will have some set of primary V nodes available. And depending on the key, we're going to have different quorums, right? Different, different sets of primary nodes. So in a partition state, a React cluster using PR and PW will go into a mode where you can read and write some keys on one side of the partition, but not others, and the complementary set of keys on another side of the partition, assuming the partitions are big enough to actually you know, in include a majority. So if, if this is nval3, you have to have two nodes on one side in order to keep writing. So writes are continuing. Uh, we're going to heal the system. So partition is now resolved. Uh, writes, again, are still, still completing. One of the clients. If we ask about Reox transfers, it should tell us. 
Yeah, so now uh, Ryoka M1, N4, and N5, those are the owners of this particular key. They're all waiting to hand off the partition that, that contains the key we were writing to. So these are, uh, or again, the fallback of nodes, but they didn't count. We should have seen failures, PR val unsatisfied messages, because we weren't able to write to the primaries. Uh, now, in this particular case, we had an interesting thing happen. Out of 2,000 writes, 1970 of them were acknowledged, and 1974 are actually present. Well, what, what's that about? Um, part of it's timeouts, right? So when a node times out, it's not necessarily a failure. Again, network errors are not failures, or I don't know. Uh, another thing is that some of those writes uh, can be, well, let's not get into that. It varies, right? Because we're dealing with timeouts, uh, and because we're dealing with, with wall clock times, not causality, unusual things can happen. Um, you'll see these PRVAL unsatisfied messages. I wanted two primary nodes, but instead I only got one. And when you collect results, you can either get no writes lost or 75% of writes lost. And the reason, again, this is, this is with PR and PW, even equal to all. The reason is that the uh, nodes on both sides are still accepting writes even if they fail. The, the, the side that doesn't have a full primary uh, quorum is still able to store those writes on disk. And when it comes back together, it will quite happily repair. It will exchange the writes that it accepted, even though they failed. It will exchange them with the, the primary v nodes and say, hey, I've got a newer timestamp than you do, so let's pick my value. So all the, all the writes that proceeded on the majority component are then discarded. Um, this, is, this is a haiku, you should all remember. <laughs> failed writes may succeed in part, then conflict. This is going to change. A lot of really smart people, including Jay Tuple, are working on bringing stronger consistency to REAC, which will include doing uh, you know, possibly multi-Paxos rounds over each quorum. Um, that'll allow you to have the transactional atomicity you want out of a single write. Now, you're probably looking at me and saying, uh, really? <laughs> like, all of these systems have lost their data? Uh, is, there, is there nothing I can do? Uh, the answer is use CRDTs. This is, not, this is not a good answer. Uh, this is a, a sort of awful answer, actually. You have to write this merge function, which is associative, commutative, idempotent over your particular values. But if you do that, React can preserve both copies of the data, you know, either, either from a simultaneous write or uh, from different sides of a partition. They look the same in a distributed system. Uh, anything that is causally disconnected by virtue of the vector clock system will be presented to you as a conflict. And if your merge function can combine those values into one, then you'll be able to recover all of your data, no matter what order these operations happen in. So you're still going to see timeouts. Uh, that's unavoidable. But in this case, we can actually proceed on all nodes, and it will lose none of the data. Out of 6,000 writes, 5,944 of them were acknowledged as successful, but all 6,000 are present in the result set, even without a lock, even in the face of total partition. Uh, so not only can we, can we partition the system once, you know, into a majority and minority component, we could cut off all of the network. We could, we could cut it into overlapping, you know, circles around a ring. We could cut it into daisy shapes. Uh, it doesn't matter. It can always work. Um, yeah, unfriendly network partitions happen. This is truly all of the rights. <laughs> so what do you do if you're a React user? Um, first thing you can do is to accept data loss. Again, not every application has to be consistent. Uh, the other thing you can do is to never, ever, ever turn off allow molt. Why is this the default? Uh, if the only cases where it's safe to use last write wins or to, to turn off allow molt, to not write a merge function, is when your writes never depend on your reads. So immutable data, right? Uh, writing logs, uh, accepting updates from another system where it doesn't, there's, no, there's no feedback loop. It's just like, OK, I'm copying data from somebody else. Um, Everywhere else, write a merge function. And it doesn't have to be a CRDT. Even if you just like, made up a merge function that mostly did the right thing, it's going to be a lot better than throwing away massive parts of your causal history. So you say, OK, I'll, I'll pick a random username, and I'll take the, the union of their followers. So maybe they can't delete followers during a partition. Uh, but that's a lot better than saying, oh, all of your writes succeeded and are now gone. Uh, and the best option, if you can do it, is to use CRDTs. These come with trade-offs. Sean Cribbs is, uh, is going to remind you. <laughs> Sean Cribs will remind you that these, uh, these let you do counters, uh, sets which you can add and remove from, um, all sorts of cool things. But they come at a cost of a lot of storage. You have to store an entry for each piece of the causal history or an entry for each actor. Uh, they're hard to garbage collect without full, without full consistency. In fact, it's, it's provable you can't. Um, so the difficulties of using CRDTs in your system may actually prohibit you from using them. 
to, uh, to go over what we've seen, uh, we've, we've taken this example system, a, a simple application which makes a bunch of writes concurrently, uh, and we've subjected it to this particular kind of network failure. And we've seen that it fails in different modes depending on how the system is configured. In each case, there were all sorts of awkward consequences. Um, Redis claims to be a CP architecture, uh, but in fact is something else entirely. Uh, Mongo you know, has this bug that makes the majority write concern not do what it says it does. Uh, React has these timeouts, which mean it's not actually available in the case of, uh, of a petition transiently. Um, so it's important to understand that what's written down in the marketing documentation, what's, what's, you know people say about the system, may not reflect how it actually behaves in your particular infrastructure. This is going to depend uh, on which database you use. And it's not just Postgres or Redis or MongoDB. These are not judgments about the databases in particular. These are, these are statements about the system, the client library, the concurrency, the networking setup. Uh, all of this has to be considered in context of your application. Uh, you know, I've, I've illustrated, OK, 75% write loss. What does that mean for you? It could be anywhere from 0 you know, to 100%. <laughs> it totally depends on how, how frequent your partitions are, how long they are. Are they simple? Are they complex? Uh, are you making lots of concurrent writes? Do your clients partition cleanly with the other side of the system? All depends. So the only way to tell, uh, I mean, like how, <laughs> nobody knows how computers work, right? Like they're so complicated on the inside, you can't predict this stuff from theory. The way to figure it out is to actually go in there and measure. You, you write a system which makes a bunch of calls against your, your API, you know, makes a bunch of writes, pretends to be a user. Uh, you introduce partitions during this, you're, you kill some nodes, you run your chaos monkey, and you verify that the state of the system lines up with what you expect after everything is resolved. Now, you might, you might do this and realize your system is not as consistent as you hoped. Uh, and this might be OK. You know, some, sometimes we don't have to have all the data. <laughs> it's, it's sort of it's, it's weird to think about, right? Because we, we really want these provable statements about the world. Uh, but in fact, the truth is much messier than that. Uh, it's, it's OK a lot of the time to garbage collect inconsistent rights, you know, to, to maybe mark down that somebody is following someone, but not that they are followed. Uh, you know, to miss reciprocal relationships if you've got a highly denormalized structure, um, to tell lies to your users, like, yeah, sure, Aunt May saw that. Uh, I never put it in her feed. You can, you can also run into performance problems, right? Like, like CRDTs will run significantly slower than just writing your data into Redis. So you have to do a trade-off in all cases to, to measure performance, which oftentimes is a factor of cost, how many nodes you only throw at the problem, how much hardware can you buy, uh, but also, also cost in terms of developer complexity. It takes human beings to write, to reason about, and to debug these systems. So if you can't understand the consistency model, if you can't predict its outcomes, it's not going to be easy to work with it in production. So occasionally, uh, choosing a dumb solution where you understand the failure modes and you have a good bound on how bad they're likely to be in production given these particular failure cases, that's going to inform how you choose to architect your system. Uh, I want to thank Dijiko Featherston for getting the ball rolling on this talk. Um, Salvatore, uh, Tengen, Basho, all the, all the database folks who've, who've been really helpful in understanding how the systems work and in actually trying to put them to the test. Um, and everyone else, I really appreciate your time and your patience. Thank you.